smooth sounds of Jimmy Mayo this morning. It sounded <laughs> good. We'll, uh, we'll do a little acoustic up here today. Um, is a mile. Yeah, we're good. So, hey, welcome to the village. Glad y'all are here. Welcome uh, for those of you that are here with us. Everybody joining online. Glad that you have chosen to, to be with us this morning. We think this is a real it's a cool place, man. It's, it's people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, people who maybe have gone to church their whole lives or maybe people who this is brand new for them and they're, or maybe people who are seeing church in a new light maybe for the first time. And uh, we, we, we think this is a, a safe place. And uh, so thank you for joining with us this morning. This is my wife, Rachel. We have a new friend with us this morning. This is Mackenzie. And Mackenzie's going to sing with us. Yeah, Mackenzie, we're so glad she's going to sing with us. And she's good, man. She's so good. So, uh, y'all, if you can, if you want to, sing with us. I think it'll be some songs that you know. But uh, I love this first song. It goes like this. It goes, Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His holy name. You know that one? Sing it with me. Sing like me. Yo 
so pretty. Yeah. One of the great things that happened through COVID, we met some wonderful new friends, and Daryl and Mackenzie are two of the best people, and they found the village, and then I remember meeting them at the park for, uh, was that the first time we met? Last Easter at the park, and so they're just two of the finest people that I know, and I didn't know she could sing like that, and so I thought, I was in the lobby, and I thought, how do they have Rachel's voice twice? That's How are they doing that in the recording? And I came in and realized that it was the most beautiful voice. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the village. We are glad that you are here. And um, I'm excited about the day. I'm excited that Stan Mitchell is in the house. And I'm excited about the message he's going to bring in just a few minutes. And I uh, just wanted to say to those watching via the Internet, thank you for joining us. If you'd like to participate giving, everybody knows the routine here. If you're seeing it for the first time at home, you can just look on the screen, and uh, we should have everything up there that, that you might need about giving that's not coming up yet. But there it is. There it is. So you can give by any of these means if you'd like to, or you can just go to the back of the auditorium, and they'll help you uh, process any kind of electronic gift. And we thank you so much. And can you believe Easter's not next Sunday, but Easter's the next Sunday. And uh, I'm, I'm more excited about Easter this year than I have been in a long, long time. And uh, I hope you'll make plans to be with us next week and then plan to be with us for Easter for sure. It's going to be a really great service. Can we take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer? Let's bow our heads. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for people in this room who have taken time out of a busy schedule to come and to sing songs of praise and to open their hearts to a message from you. Thank you for the promise that you are always with us, that you never leave us. Thank you for the beautiful lessons that we celebrate this time of year, the resurrection and what that means. I pray today will be a lovely day and people's hearts will grow. And I just pray that when we leave this place, we'll say it's been good to be in church with other friends in this place. Thank you for this day, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Wish 
worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. The more I seek you, the more I find you. The more I find you, the more. Feel your 
sound real great this morning. Uh, Mackenzie, you are wonderful. I hope you come back. I, listen, we're, gonna, we're just going to keep asking you. How about that? Did, you, did y'all enjoy Mackenzie this morning? Wasn't she great? Oh, my gosh. Love, love, love her. All right. Well, y'all, my friend, Stan Mitchell, buddy, I'm glad you're here, and uh, I can't wait to hear your word this morning. So, Thanks, Ethan. And wow, Mackenzie, false humility. Just false humility is Amazing, beautiful. Um, so glad to be with you guys always, not just the folks here at the village, but all the folk watching online. Um, I always say that the village is one of my two attachments as a local church home, obviously. Grace Point, the church that I helped found back in 2003, it's a significant part of my life, and I got to be there last week. And so to be here with you guys two weeks in a row is pretty significant. I also say, and this has worked out pretty well for me and hopefully for y'all, that you're a bit of a laboratory. I don't preach as much as I used to, Ray, so you kind of get out of the rhythm of it, but I often have ideas that I feel, um, I feel like using you guys as guinea pigs on, and I hope you don't mind the guinea pig status, but generally it feels like it works out pretty well, but I'm safe to... Uh, land a bomb here. If it doesn't go well, you guys will still love me. Everywhere else I, gotta, I go, I've got to do really well. But um, I wrote this. I'll start with something I wrote. I guess it was about four years ago, and it was in significant reference to what I do in my life. Again, as one of my church homes, you guys know that a huge part of my life is LGBTQ advocacy. I work on behalf of LGBTQ people and their families, people who primarily are wrestling at this intersection of gender, sexuality, and their faith, their spirituality. People who have been led to believe that those two things are mutually exclusive. And so I've, I found myself there. That actually wasn't, nor is it still when I really think about it, what I would consider my primary calling. Obviously, as a minister, a Christian minister, the gospel is the primary calling. But when I think about what the gospel is, for me, the last 20 years of my life have been dedicated to helping people mature and move out of and beyond fear-based religion. Not only helping people move out of fear-based religion, and hopefully within the bounds of my own religion, Christianity, helping that religion grow and mature, but along with moving beyond fear-based religion, there also is this issue that within the LGBTQ community certainly is highly visible, 
And that is this matter of helping people heal from the damaging effects of fear-based religion. Part of the moving beyond is the healing. Well, in reference to all of that, I do a lot of thinking there, a lot of ministry there, a lot of pastoral care there. And I wrote this maybe four years ago. I don't panic anymore when former Christian people no longer find value in Christianity. Might sound like a strange thing to say for someone who considers himself a Christian minister. I don't panic anymore when these folk tell me that they don't even find value in Jesus. The reason I don't panic is because through the years it has little by little dawned on me that a significant fraction of what these folk call Christ, a significant fraction of what these folk call Christian, Christianity, even Jesus, a significant amount of that is actually a poor facsimile, a poor representation, actually a whole lot of bad ideas masquerading and trying to get sold under the false identity of a truly holy man. Some of these bad ideas are actually abhorrent. My older brother, by two years, he just last week turned 56 and I turned 54. My older brother, by those two years, is one of those people that I don't worry, I don't worry about. The same year, 1984, that I loudly headed into Christian ministry, my brother quietly headed out of Christianity. As you might guess, I, by a significant amount, received the most and best attention back in those days. And I must say, I have enjoyed the past 35 years for sure, 38 now. But interestingly, so has he. And actually, it wouldn't be hard to argue by those who know both of us that his life may more closely approximate the life and peace of the one, capital O, he doesn't formally follow. He's an exceptional human, this big brother of mine, if not Christian. And that's arguable, at least the last part. He's a really exceptional human being. I told him a while back, if Jesus, as I suspect, does turn out to be the guy, he's not going to condemn you. I told my brother, if Jesus turns out to be the guy, I think he'll shake your hand. I think he'll thank you. Because I have a pretty strong sense that my brother's departure from Christianity was in its own way at least as much a defense of the real Jesus as my staying in has been. Does that make sense? What many have called my brother's loss of faith may have actually been a finding of faith. A finding of faith that he articulated differently than mine. I told my brother that reading it again, that his departure from Christianity was at least as much a defense of the real Jesus as my staying in and life as a reverend has been. I spent a lot of years praying for my brother. These days I'm trying to actually be more like him. Kindness, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, meekness, faith. Those who know us would agree that his report card generally rates a little higher than mine on these things. Oh yes, those things that are called fruit of the Spirit. My brother probably looks more like Jesus than I do, and it's more than his long hair that he hasn't cut in years which probably was because as two little boys, we grew up feeling like 
if our hair touched our collar or our ears, that our salvation was in jeopardy. That long hair was a testament, is a testament to his faith. In a Jesus that he thought he rejected, but actually a Jesus that he simply knew had to be better than the way he was told. That post that I made four years ago about my brother came out of a conversation he and I had. He had come to Nashville, and we had gone to a Steelers game. I don't call it a Titans game because we're a Steelers fan, and every other year or so, we get a home game with the Steelers. It's kind of sad. Steelers travel pretty well. <laughs> and in Nashville, when the Steelers are in town, there's more black and gold than there is blue and red and terrible towels. So my brother, yeah, God bless you. There's a Christian in the crowd. My brother had come over from Memphis to go to a Steelers game. We walked over to an eating place after we parked our car. We had some time before the game. and I don't know if my brother and I had talked about spirituality, God, or anything like that in years. I had kind of left off with that and come to some of these conclusions before even writing them. But my brother, who is a very soft-spoken, understated human being, he said to me as we were walking along from the eating place, the restaurant, back to the stadium, he said, do you still worry about me? And I said, how do you mean? And he said, you know, the whole religion thing. I said, I, I, I haven't thought about that in a long time, but to your question, I would say, no, I don't worry about you. He said quietly, good. I said, can I apologize to you for something? And he said, I don't know that you need to. And I said, you sure did make some good sermon illustrations years ago. He said, I heard a few of those. I said, I'm sorry. Turned out those stories about a prodigal and an elder brother and a father and a far country, those stories, the longer you live with them, you realize that the character you thought you were, you may not have been. And maybe the reality is we've been every one of the characters. We walked a little further and that's when I told him, and it occurred to me. I said, you know, what you, what you experienced as a quick exit from a form of Christianity that taught our sister she couldn't wear slacks, couldn't wear makeup, couldn't cut her hair. My dad and I just a few nights ago watched The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams, the movie, 1974. Remember that? Dan Haggerty. It was such a sentimental moment for me because it was the first time I had seen that movie in 48 years. I saw it the first time at the movie theater in Paragould, Arkansas, as my dad, obviously in a backslidden state, took my brother and I, six and eight years old, to the theater. Do you, re do you know, and we laugh about this, but you laugh to keep from crying, I still remembered as I watched that movie the other night, just a few nights ago, I still remembered the smell, the taste, the sound, the feeling of as a six-year-old child hoping the rapture didn't take place. Again, it's funny in retrospect, and yet it's not. As a six-year-old child, I couldn't even enjoy the simplest and the sweetest of movies about a mountain man who loved animals because my eternal consequence was hanging in jeopardy. Now, the way I've handled all of that was I became a reverend at 16 years old, poured myself into that, and then deconstructed 
And by the time I deconstructed, I was so vocationally far into it that I couldn't possibly, for many reasons, leave it. So from within, I made my journey of first naivete, criticism, second naivete. I made my way through orientation, disorientation, reorientation, construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. I made my way through, led churches through the process, led churches up and down and over and around through the process, lived my life now working in that process. That was my response. That was my response to the kind of religion that Jesus looked at the Pharisees one day and said, I understand you. You heap impossible burdens. You come into people's life promising them good news and you heap burdens on them that are unbearable, untenable. Jesus said, you heap burdens on people that they cannot possibly bear. Now, there's three parts to this condemnation by Jesus. Jesus said, the first thing you do is you put burdens on people and you tell them these are the commands of God. You tell them these commands, these prohibitions, these admonitions are somehow the expression of God's heart. This is the mind of God, you tell them. And yet you're putting religious burdens on people. You're putting burdens on little six-year-old boys that think to go to the movie and watch a G-rated movie puts their eternal consequence in jeopardy and threatens them with eternal damnation and fire. Do you know how devastating it is for a six-year-old child to even carry the concept of eternal torture? And then to think that it might be unavoidable Jesus said, you put religious burdens on people. That's the first thing you do. And then Jesus said, the second thing you do is you watch the people as they collapse under the burden. Eventually, they will collapse because that's an untenable burden. It's an unbearable burden. He didn't say burdens that are hard to bear. If you go back to the original, Jesus didn't say these burdens are hard to bear. He said they are impossible to bear. They may be born a while, but eventually the psyche, the soul bearing those, the lives bearing those burdens will collapse. That is why people like Ray and Jane and myself and others, ministers around the country, of Christian churches. That's, that's why we have revisited the LGBTQ issue. It wasn't because of some abstract theory coming down from a divinity school somewhere or some systematic theologian we followed. It's because we pastored these people and we began to notice with a lot of other people that these children were attempting suicide six to eight times more often. It's unavoidable. We begin noticing that Their attempts were five to seven times more more credible, more likely to succeed. Not than heterosexual children, cisgender children, but of LGBTQ children raised in affirming homes. Those kind of incarnational realities, suffering, there's really three things about those people for me. It was the... It was, it was their testimony of Christ. I could not. There was a sense. I listened to their testimonies of their encounter with Christ, and they were real. That's exactly what Peter said when he came back to James, and he said, I, I shared with Cornelius and his household, and James, the brother of Jesus, said, you shouldn't even have eaten with those people. Christian church has been fraught with inclusion issues from its earliest days, and I thank God that's in the text Because not only did we get some things wrong, we showed the capacity to be corrected and then to humbly change right out of the chute. Peter looked at James and he said, you know, two preachers, I guess we could have fun and argue scripture here, but I don't even know how to argue scripture. All I know is the Holy Spirit fell on them as it did on us in the beginning. The witness of these people experience of Christ was too much. You know what the second thing was, Ray? It was not the witness of their initial experience or their encounters with the Holy Spirit. It was the fruit of their lives. The fruit of their lives. They were beautiful Christians. And then the third thing that was really the thing that we've talked about before was their suffering. 
it began to dawn on me that this suffering that I saw was not the result of their sin. This was the suffering of the body of Christ. This was not the suffering of cancerous parts of the body. This was not the suffering of parts of the body that were gangrenous and needed to be amputated. This was the suffering of beautiful living parts of the body of Christ. And we were driven back to the text. We were driven back to the text with the question if we read this most faithfully. In working with LGBTQ Christians especially, one of the things that I continue to see again and again and again and again and again is that being raised in a religious environment that Jesus described to the Pharisees. He said, you heap burdens on them, and here's the, here, here's the dastardly thing. These burdens that you heap upon them, they are nothing more than cruel burdens, but you entangle them, wrap them, and masquerade them as the heart of God. So watch what happens. When the person collapses under that unbearable burden, when that queer child collapses under that unbearable burden, they don't know they've collapsed under an unbearable burden. They feel like they have broken because something is wrong with them. They are misaligned with God. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you watch them as they collapse under the burden. You see them embroiled in that tangle of soul. For Jesus, faith, spirituality, gender, sexuality is so entangled, they don't know what to do. And then the third thing that Jesus said to them that was the ultimate condemnation was as they lay in that collapsed place, that devastated, that wrecked place, Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you don't even lift a finger to help them. As a matter of fact, you double down on the initial sin, your sin, and you tell them the reason they're here. And every time, Ray, I'm dealing with a family, which is almost daily, who says, well, the reason these children are suffering so deeply is not because of the church's mistake, it's because of sin in their life. Is it any wonder that there are groups of people like this group who as they gather themselves from the rubble and the wreckage of that religious process, they walk away from it. And similar to my brother say, not madly, not angrily, but E, they simply say, it doesn't work for me anymore. Well, yesterday, and this is what led me to the formation, and I know this is more than a sermon, this is probably a book, at least a series of sermons. But yesterday morning, it wasn't yesterday morning, it was actually Thursday or Friday morning, it's been a couple of days now. I wrote this yesterday afternoon upon reflection. A couple of mornings ago, in conversation with a family, I listened as the elderly mother, a woman almost 90, still an active counselor. I listened as the elderly mother asked her late middle-aged daughter, it was a mom, a dad, and a daughter. The daughter was older than I am. I met these people because they work with a friend of mine, with Christian people around this issue of inclusion, because this late middle-aged daughter, who's I guess about 60, is herself gay. As a child, she went through the unbearable burden. Her parents exacted that burden on her. Somewhere in their 20s, the parents came to a place of inclusion. There was healing. And now, as a family, they tell their story and they help other families that are towing the threshold of that experience. So that's why I was talking to these people. So we were talking about their work and the work of my friend that they work with. And somewhere in the course of the conversation, this was what was interesting. The mother said, there is something that still bothers me in all of this. 
she turned to her daughter and said, it bothers me that through all of that, you lost your faith. I think she said, you are no longer a person of faith. The daughter, who also is a mental health care professional, a counselor, the daughter was incredibly thoughtful in her response to her mom. She's a very articulate woman, but I just, as a fly on the wall, knew I was about to watch something. You can just feel that I was about to hear something holy. And I watched the daughter as she paused several times searching for the right words. And then I listened to her as she kindly explained to her mom, and I think even a bit to herself, how growing up gay in an evangelical home had proven, quote, pervasively confusing. I listened to her explain to her almost 90-year-old mom how one residual of that pervasive confusion pertain to, quote, matters of faith, God, and spirituality. I then listened as the mother and daughter, these two healthcare professionals, mental healthcare professionals, to all-around insightful people. I listened to the two of them have about a five to ten minute thoughtful conversation about this. I listened to the daughter say, I actually did not lose my spirituality. I think I found my spirituality. I I didn't lose my faith. It reminded me of something I heard someone say years ago, and I've said it many times since. I didn't lose my faith. I lost yours, right? I didn't lose my faith. I lost my parents' faith, (laughs) found mine. I listened to her describe, and her mother was incredibly thoughtful and received all of it. At some point in the discussion, the daughter turned to me and said, I know you deal with this type of thing a lot. I would be interested to hear your thoughts. Now, here's... Every now and then I can see glimmers of growth in my life, and here's one of them. Because when she turned to me, I mean, this was a conversation of four people. Ten years ago, I would have been chomping at the bit the entire conversation to get my words in. Remember those days in your life when you thought you had so much to say? Anybody figured out the older you get, you have less to say than you used to? My great-granddad said wisdom is a lifetime of listening when you'd rather be talking. I'd not even rather be talking anymore. So when she turned and said, I know I would love to hear your thoughts about this stand. She was almost looking at me, help me with mom so she's not worried about me. I realized that I'm growing as a human being because when she said that to me, it surprised me. And I realized I didn't have a preformed response because I hadn't been sitting there semi-listening to them, formulating what I was going to say. So it took me off guard a little bit. And I said, huh, I I don't know. And I kind of did some stammering to kind of put it on autopilot, and I prayed a wordless, witless prayer somewhere in my heart. And it was one of those prayers that simply says, if I do have something to say here, the Holy Spirit, the muse, whatever you call it, share that with me. And I waited as they looked, and a scripture dropped down into my mind. And I just told this story. It comes from Matthew 28. This is the story I told. It's Ray's preaching Easter. I'll be here Easter, but Ray's preaching Easter. So I'm going to preempt Easter, and I'm going to do a resurrection read here. This is what I told them. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And I, I just had a thought here. If you feel like this is not going anywhere, generally I feel that way in all of my sermons, but on this one, I want to really encourage you. Hang on, this is about to get really good. <laughs> it really is. If I can pull this off the way I shared it with them. The women went to the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. Mm, so much here. Aren't you glad you now understand the Bible is not a bunch of stories to recount, to recollect, to store away and remember that it happened to people 2,000 years ago. This is a wisdom tradition that is so brilliant. Every one of us have lived these stories. We find ourselves in them. So I'm talking to this mom and this daughter. Thoughts about what it means to come through what they came through and to lose faith and move beyond Christianity. Don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus. He is not here. He's not where you saw him last. He's not what he was anymore. As far as you're concerned, he is gone, and it is heartbreaking. This hasn't turned out the way you thought it was going to. But you're here. So this is what I want to do. Come see the place where he lay. I shared a couple of thoughts about that, and there was a long pause. After the long pause, the daughter, my friend, said, have you written that down anywhere? And I said, maybe bits and pieces, but I've never thought of that text this way. I've thought of that text a hundred ways. I've preached that particular text three different ways to you guys and never saw it this way. The daughter softly said, would you do me a favor and when you have time, write that down and send it to me. I said, I, I'll try. And so I sit down yesterday afternoon, and this is what I wrote, and it's what I'll leave you with today. You asked me if I had anything to say about people who have gone through religious wounding in a Christian setting and have not only had their faith shaken, but have actually left off with Christ, Jesus, Christianity. You asked me if I had anything to say about all of that. I wasn't sure if I did, but then a story dropped down into my heart that I shared with you. You asked me to write it. The story comes from the life of Jesus. And I think its brilliance is not that it happened once for all of us to recall and recount, but I think its brilliance is that it is a wisdom template, one we all can at some point find ourselves living. The story goes like this. After he died, some of his closest friends and followers, women, went to visit his tomb. They were heartbroken. 
They were disappointed. In no way were they there because they believed in a resurrection. These women showed up at the tomb. They were heartbroken. They were disappointed, wrecked, actually. Jesus had been taken from them. And I want to say about every queer child who has ever, somewhere between 13 and 23, Ray, walked out of churches and said, I cannot not be me. And are forced to choose between Jesus and themselves. Though they are surrounded by a church, family, and friends who believe they made the wrong choice, I want to say about them, when they chose themselves over this representation of Jesus, it was the best move they could possibly spiritually make. And it was not a rejection of the real Jesus. It may have been in the body of Christ they are the actual ultimate acceptance of who he is. Jesus had been taken from these women. He hadn't died of some normal illness. Cruel people murdered him. Jesus had been taken from them, stolen. Everything they thought they knew about him Everything they thought he was and was going to do was no more. Gone. And yet in spite of the fact he was gone, they loved him. They loved him in absentia. They didn't love the way he had left them. They didn't love the way he had been stolen. They didn't love the confusion, the disappointment. They didn't love the loss of everything they held in hope about him. But they were there that day because they loved who he had been. He may not have continued with them, their hopes of a future with him had obviously and cruelly been erased. But that did not undo what had been. That did not undo what and who he had been. It did not undo the beauty that was. So the women went to the tomb to tend to and to honor that beauty. The women went to the tomb to take an ember from the ashes of a quenched fire and to blow gentle breaths of love on that ember until it glowed in memory and warmed their hurting hearts. And an angel came to them. And the angel told the heartbroken women that Jesus indeed was no longer in the tomb, but risen. And this is the epiphany for me. Upon telling the heartbroken women that Jesus was not there, that he had risen, intuitively, I would have suspected the angels to say, take my hand. I'm going to take you to him right now. But Ray, the angel didn't do that. The angel didn't look at these heartbroken women and say, he's alive, I want to reintroduce you. I want you to meet the resurrected Christ. It'll take care of everything. 
the complexity of what had just happened in their psyche, their soul. One of these women was Mary Magdalene. This was not just about what had happened in the previous few days. This was about a woman who the Bible describes as a woman of ill repute, a woman who could have been a, 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 a person of the night who sold her body to try to make a living. We don't know, but we do know that when she met Jesus, she may have been the woman that Luke's gospel says came into the room while Jesus was with a bunch of Pharisees at a meal. And in that place that she would have least wanted to have gone at any normal moment of her life, she dropped down to the feet of Jesus. The Bible said she let down her hair and just begin to wash his feet. She brought oil and perfume to put on his feet, but she couldn't even get to the oil and perfume because her tears. We don't even know the preliminary story. The only thing that I can think of is that somewhere in some intersection or intersections of grace, her broken life had, had come into contact with this man who looked at her differently than other men, who was kind to her, who perhaps shared a meal with her. It had to be something like that. Jesus had somehow impacted her so strongly that when she heard he was back in town, even though he was at a gathering of preachers, she walked into the house, dropped to her feet, and just started bathing his feet, rather, with her tears. The Bible says Simon, the lead Pharisee, watched her with consternation. He knew she was probably a prostitute, and she's doing something at the feet of Jesus that looks intimate and provocative and projecting all of his own sexual idiosyncrasies. He just captures the moment and says, well, this is gross. What kind of a fetish is this? And the Bible says, as Simon looks at her thinking all of those thoughts, look at this triangle. Simon is looking at her with religious consternation. She's looking at Jesus with transformative life heart change. And the Bible says that Jesus is doing something interesting there. He's not looking at her. He's looking at the one in the gravest of needs. He's looking at Simon, the religious guy. Simon hasn't even vocalized these things, but Jesus finally, with her at his feet, Simon's eyes on her, Jesus looks at Simon and says, why are you thinking these things about her? And I don't think that was a rhetorical question. I think it was a real question. I think it was a therapeutic question. You do yourself a big favor, Simon, to quit thinking the thoughts you're thinking and to go deep, subterranean, down to the root of your heart and ask yourself, why is it that you're looking at her this way? Out of that story, the next chapter in Luke's gospel tells of how there was a woman who was possessed of many demons and she was delivered of those demons and putting two and two together, we think it was probably Mary. That's the story filled with pathos that follows Jesus waiting for him to bring the kingdom to the earth, waiting for him to do for others what he had done for her. And then in a tangled snarl of confusion and disappointment, she watches him crucified. And while all of the other disciples went back to their nets and back to their lives, she spent all day Saturday between Friday and Sunday just preparing perfume, embalming fluids, because he had been too beautiful in her life to stink, to let rot, And she went to the tomb carrying not just those days of confusion, but an entire life. This is what I told the woman when she said, do you have anything to say to me? Do you have anything to say about this journey that so many people take away from Christianity? Yes. 
and that is I no longer feel a need in the lives of people like you to take you by the hand and say, I would like to reintroduce you to a resurrected Christ. I no longer feel any need to show up at tombs, places filled with brokenness, pathos, and a complexity of another person's life that I couldn't dare to approximate in my mind or understand. Somebody say, you have to take a, you know, a mile in their shoes. No, 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 you'd have to take every step they've ever taken. And forget that, you'd have to have their feet and the body attached to the feet and the heart attached to that body. How have I never seen this in the story? When the angel showed up and met those first broken-hearted people, the angel doesn't immediately take them to Jesus. No, that's not the angel's job. It's not my job. I'll tell you the end of the story. After the angel does what he does, the women, after experiencing that angelic work, and that's the work of the proclaimers of the Gospels. We do the work of angels, not the work of God. Only God does that work. We are proclaimers. We are on gloss. We are messengers sent. After the angel did his work, it's true. Read the story. Jesus meets them. The resurrected Christ comes. Because you know what? Jesus shows up when he wants to show up, and he appears to who he wants to appear, when he wants to appear, when he thinks it's best to appear. And he didn't appear to all of them at the same time. The Bible said he took 40 days and he appeared to Simon by himself and he appeared to John by himself and he appeared to three here and 12 here and 500 there. He did appear to the women down the road after the angel had done his work. And it was a beautiful thing when Jesus came. The healing was full and full. But the work of the angel is the work that so many people need. The angel said, it's not my job to reintroduce you to Jesus. The angel said, would you take my hand and would you come and see the tomb? Would you come to the tomb, that symbol of all of your grief and sorrow and hopelessness, would you come and see the place where he lay? Would you see the place where you hurt most? Would you touch the place of your greatest wounding and loss? Because before he appears to you, there's probably another work that needs to be done. There was and is a reality to your pain, and it is real. It happened, and you need to see it, and you need to touch it in all of its dark cruelty. You need to come to the tomb and see that it is empty. And ultimately, the emptiness that would have tormented you now is an emptiness that promises. It promises the gospel to you place of your greatest pain has lost its power over you. And you can be healed here. And your heart can be prepared. And who knows? Somewhere down the road, you may meet Jesus again. Somewhere down the road, he may show up. But that's between the two of you. We do ourselves no favor by rushing to resurrections before we have fully processed our crucifixions. We do ourselves no favor to try to dry our tears, snub our tears, press down the trauma that has just happened or has happened over the course of a life. We do ourselves no favor to rush to crucifixions before we have tended sufficiently to the burials. To the burials of those things we have lost, those things we thought would last forever. And the beautiful 
thing about resurrection that we're going to celebrate in a couple of weeks at Easter is that Paul said the good news is that Christ died and he was buried and he rose again and then he was seen. Somehow, the pain and the death and a heartbreak are redeemed to a place of goodness if for no other reason than they have a capacity to hollow out a place in our soul, a place of emptiness that can once more be filled. They can open our hearts to a capacity for new life and resurrection that we would have never known. Honestly, I'm not sure there's another way. So I got out of a group call with a mom and a daughter who were continuing to talk, but instead of the preacher taking the non-Christian and reintroducing them to a resurrected Christ, I left an adult daughter, Ray, with an adult mother standing at an empty tomb talking about a pain so great, a robbery so cruel, theft so evil it should have never happened but did. It was such a holy moment that I had to get out of the Zoom call, Rachel, because I didn't belong there. This was 30 years in the making. And I'm telling you, and this may be presumptuous of me, I don't know that the woman will ever call herself a Christian again. I don't know that Jesus will ever be real to her again. I don't know that that's the way it needs to happen, but I'm telling you, it wouldn't surprise me a bit that somewhere down the road on the other side of that angelic work at an empty tomb, the place of pain, that maybe, just maybe, when you least expect it here and there, now and then, (laughs) Christ shows up the one you thought you had lost forever. So with tongue in cheek, I say, and I I don't like sarcasm, but I say, forgive me. Forgive me to the Christian world. Forgive me to the ordination that I'm called to. But most of the time with the kids that I'm working with, most of the time with the people that I'm working with, LGBTQ people that have had Jesus robbed, cruelly stolen from them, most of the time I don't do the Jesus work of trying to restore their faith in him. I do the angelic work of showing up at the tomb and tending to the place of the wound. And isn't that what Jesus did with Mary? When he showed up after Lazarus' death. And when Mary came out of the house, I've told you the story many times, and fell at his feet, looked at him and said, if you would have been here, everything she thought she knew about Jesus was gone. She had not only lost Lazarus, she had lost Jesus. She had lost faith. Jesus doesn't look at her and say, abracadabra, look out the window, there's Lazarus. He doesn't do that. He picks her up and quietly goes where? To the tomb. And he doesn't look at her at the tomb and say, hold on to your hat, watch this, and roll a stone away. The Bible said he looks at her with Lazarus in the grave and the remedy is not to raise Lazarus. The Bible said he looked at her and the scripture says, Jesus wept and they laid their head on one another's shoulders and they cried about what had been lost and the hurt and the pain of it all and only as they wallowed out their souls by connecting to grief and mourning lament is love song Grief is testimony to the worth of what has been lost. Only in the hollowness and the spaciousness, the measure of that hollowness was the estimation of the worth of the thing lost. Only in that hollowness was she then equipped to hear Jesus say, roll the stone away. Lazarus, come forth.
That is the gospel story, and that's the work that we are called to do. Angels we are, messengers of grace, to tend gently to the wounds of people from whom Jesus has been stolen. Amen? Father, thank you for this lovely text. Thank you for the lovely people who who just in the last few days have helped me find this gospel text anew. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, in this season of resurrection, I pray for those who are struggling so hard to hang on to Jesus and hang on to faith and find Jesus again. I pray for every queer kid who feels like giving up, never going back to Sunday school again, never singing Amazing Grace again. I pray for every person from whom Jesus has been robbed. I pray, sweet Christ, that they will hang on to the Christ that is in them, in their own bodies, in their own love, in their own truth. Because maybe the unnamed Jesus in them, in their love, in their reality, in their truth, maybe that is the body of Christ. More than this flannel graph Sunday school, pulpit banging horror that they had heard was God. May they find themselves, may they heal in that place and somewhere down the road, may they even may they even meet a resurrected Christ. One that renews and rebuilds a faith that they could have never imagined. I pray all of this for those listening outside of this room, for those in the room, for myself. May we do the work of angels until Christ come. I pray this in Christ's name. And God's people said, amen, amen. That's the good news. <laughs>